You are listening to Over and Back's Basketball Mysteries of the 1970s. Today's mystery is, how did the ABA teams adjust to the NBA? We are brought to you today by The Replay with L and Al. Have you ever wondered how your favorite NBA players spend their time off the court? If so, The Replay with L and Al is a perfect podcast for you. They discuss everything from endorsement deals and power couples to fashion choices and social media. Listen in every week, and we promise you'll be hipper than Joel Embiid's pregame dance routines. Check out the replay on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts, or check it out at The Step Back. All right, welcome to Over and Back. I am Jason, and with me again is Adam Johnson of Basketball Pantheon. And we are talking about how the ABA teams did once they joined the NBA in the 1977 season. Of course, the uh, 1976 merger puts the ABA teams at a bit of a disadvantage when they're coming into the league. They have to pay $3.2 million each to get in the league. The Nets have to pay an additional $4-plus million because they're in, the, uh, they're in the Knicks New York territory, which we'll kind of get into a little bit there. Um, also, because they came in after the draft, it had already happened. They did not get any picks in the 1976 draft. But, and there's also, of course, a feeling among a lot of people in the NBA that the ABA was the inferior league, that these teams, you know, don't don't belong with us. These, these players, well, you know, maybe they put up numbers in the ABA, but they are, aren't going to do it in our league. And that turned out to really not be the case. The ABA players certainly... Uh, acquitted themselves very well in the 1977 season and you know a couple of the ABA teams definitely struggled but a couple of them were pretty successful as well yeah definitely um the 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 like we talked about when we did the Kentucky Colonels um, episode how the league at the end there the ABA at the end there was very top heavy so and that meant that when those guys did come over to the NBA at least those kind of that top half of, of each of those rosters were really going to succeed and you know obviously the NBA is going to have some uppity you know mindsets like oh here we go now they're in the big leagues but uh, but you're right no it, it, it definitely um, they held their own for sure and more yeah and you know another thing that um, you know the ABA teams toward the end were definitely had their eye on being as um, appealing as possible in a merger so getting that star power and getting you know if you were in a position of strength you really wanted to have a strong team to make sure that the you know the ABA was going to get you that was one um, impetus behind the Nuggets acquiring David Thompson and Dan Issel for instance is because you know okay if we have David Thompson then you know we're they're, they're going to pick us for the merger, you know, because David Thompson's a star, a star and, you know, and was, re, you know, really considered an incredible star at, at the time. You know, unfortunately, things happened that, uh, you know, it derailed his career, but he was, uh, you know, he was, looked like he was going to be the Michael Jordan before Michael Jordan. I mean, he had a lot of those same skills and a lot of, you know, was um, an incredible player for a few seasons. Um, so, you know, one interesting thing about 77 is it's the first year that the league actually plays a fairly balanced schedule of playing um four games for almost every team in the league um before this there you would play there were four divisions and you would play the teams within your division uh seven times and then the teams that were in the conference out in the other division uh, roughly five times and then everyone else roughly four times so um but the 77 season they changed they had four more teams and it just sort of works out pretty well uh this way and also um the the, the leagues are not geographically aligned in the way that we normally think that they were the uh the rockets the spurs the jazz who are still in new orleans and the uh, braves who become the clippers and who are in buffalo are all in the east and the pistons the bulls the pacers and the bucks are all in the west so that cre- it's going to create some playoff matchups of teams that we are not used to playing in the playoffs but i uh, just want to get that in ahead of time um so we'll, we'll kind of go through the teams um one by one first the nuggets uh, their last year in the aba they in the 76 season they were 16 and 24 with a, a 4.5 srs uh, i was one year after the nuggets uh name change and even better regular season 65 and 19 they were disappointed in the playoffs so they they added um uh david thompson and dan issel went to the aba finals where they lost they were coached by larry brown also had ralph simpson bobby jones byron beck who was a nine-year aba vet and marvin webster who was a, a, a talented young player um, a good defensive big man who ended up kind of having disappointing in the uh, pros of the lead one very good season with uh, Seattle. Um, and then 77, they're also a strong regular season team, 50 and 32, 4.95 SRS. It should be noted also that the 77 season is incredibly, um, 
the 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 win totals and loss totals. There's an incredible amount of parity. The top win total is around 52, and the the low the worst loss total is around 26. So uh, so 15 32 is is like second or third in the um, in in the league in, in terms of record. So there's still that is it's a more impressive accomplishment than you might think based on. Um, based on their actual record. And they have Paul Silas, uh, still have Willie Wise, or they actually they had Willie Wise, who'd come from, of course, the great Utah star, Matt Calvin, Ted McLean, Fatty Taylor. So a lot, a lot of, uh, other than Silas, a lot of old um, ABA players who, um, you know, presumably Larry Brown and Carl Shearer, the uh, general manager who had come over from the ABA, you know, they know these guys can play. They, they know those guys very well. We're, we're able to, uh, they, they won their division and they, gave the eventual champion Blazers a tough series uh, in six games in the Western Conference semifinals. Yeah, no, it, it's a very impressive first season for Denver, uh, no question. I mean, they had the Issel, Jones, and Thompson trio that really wreaked havoc on the NBA, uh, kind of the second they walked in. And yeah, I, I was glad that you pointed out the win totals were really odd that first season. Um, after the merger, there's 22 teams. It's the most you know the NBA's ever had at that point. And yeah, there wasn't this like clearly defined class system is like this kind of big middle class and there's a few that stood out and um yeah the Nuggets are the second best SRS in the league out of 22 after you know having the, the best in the ABA the year before that's a very impressive um accomplishment for a team that you know I don't think I don't think everybody thought that they were going to be that good it's like when you when you have Issel and Thompson it's like well that's you know certainly they're coming in with some star power and you know we'll see they like to score but uh, but they actually were first in defensive rating in the NBA the first year uh and in, in as as a member of the NBA, so that's that's a huge accomplishment for for Denver. I thought, yeah. And reading, I, I read a book recently about the seventy uh, seven season called uh, "What's Happening," and it focuses. It's by Blaine Johnson, who's a beat writer for the Sonics. It focuses mostly on the Sonics, but he makes an, a bet early on in the season of whether the Nuggets are even going to, of whether any ABA teams are ever going to make the playoffs. And he, you know, but specifically didn't think the Nuggets were going to. And then, of course, the Nuggets end up, you know, being winning the division, and being a really successful team. So. um so it kind of gives you a sense of what was expected uh, during that time. Um, so yeah, the, the, during that series, uh, and it was actually you know, a fairly close series. Portland won a, a squeaker in game one with Lucas hitting a game winner, 11 seconds in the game. Uh, Maurice Lucas, uh, David Thompson scores 40 points in game three, but even they, they fall short in that game. They did win game two in Denver. So in Denver had the home court advantage. Um, because they had the better record. The Blazers won 49 games, I think, so it was very close. Game five, the Blazers would make a big comeback, but uh, then the Nuggets would win in overtime. And then uh, game six, that would be the, a famous game for the Blazers where rookie Johnny Davis was went into the starting lineup after Dwight, Dwight Tordzik got hurt, and he had a, a, a huge uh, – helped them take a 33-16 to lead and then ended up um, – having 25 points on 10 or 14 shooting to, and then was a key part of them upsetting the Sixers in the championship as well. And then moving forward is 78. They, um, their SRS is down quite a bit to just 0.8. Uh, they are a 48 win team though. Uh, they, they end up kind of going a bit younger with Bob Wilkerson, Anthony Roberts and Bo Ellis all under 23. A lot of those veterans are cycled out, but Silas ends up going to Seattle uh, the Nuggets struggle financially. They're actually sold to Spurs part owner Red McCombs for a reported $10 million. Uh, this is the season in which David Thompson scores 73 in the final game as he's competing with George Griffin for the scoring title. Griffin actually wins the scoring title, but when he scores 63 in the uh, same day. Uh, the Nuggets do beat the Bucks in seven games to reach the Western Conference Finals. The Nuggets Bucks playoff series, of course, is um, uh, as we're unaccustomed to. The uh, the Bucks actually were a bit of a surprise that year. They were the sixth seed, and that was back when only six teams made the playoffs for each conference. So, um, Marcus Johnson, Brian Winters, Alex English, uh, of course, feature Nugget, who was on the uh, Bucks during this time and would actually have a really uh, big game in this series. Would um, uh, would play very well late in the series, uh, English having 21 points in um, Game 6. Then finally, the Denver was able to win Game 7, 116-110, uh, to with uh, David Thompson scoring 37 points. This was actually during a time... Um, uh, Thompson was given a... He was re-signed to what was the uh, most expensive... Um, uh, NBA contract in history, uh, making eight hundred thousand a year between seventy eight and eighty three, and um, but then he sort of, sort of struggled a bit early on in the series, but then ended up being successful later. Then they would lose to the Sonics in uh, six games. The Sonics would go to the finals that year, um, and then in seventy nine. They would trade Bobby Jones for George McGinnis, sign Shelly Scott. They would struggle early, uh, start playing a bit better, but uh, Larry Brown would uh, 
resign on February 1st to take the coaching job at UCLA, which... Uh, well, Shocking that Larry Brown would resign in the middle of the season or yes. leave someone out to dry, you know. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so he would do the same thing with the uh, Nets in uh, 82 or 83, I believe. And yeah, uh, yeah, 83. And um, and then Donnie Walsh actually replaced him, of course, the future you know famous Pacers executive. And uh, they would um, only fall one game short of winning the Midwest Division. Uh, they would lose to the Lakers, though, in a three-game series. And then um, going on, like, after 80, they were not a good team in, in uh, 80. Um, Thompson only played 39 games that year with a with an injury. This was also kind of the period in which he started having his substance abuse uh, issues. Um, then they would trade George McGinnis to the Pacers, for who, who at that point had Alex English. And they would bring Doug Moe in to finish the 81 series, and he would coach through 1990, and they would be mostly successful during that time. Had a, um, And they would have an up-tempo motion style offense where they would score more than 100 points in 136 consecutive games and set a points-per-game average uh, record in 82 with 126.5 per game, um, where they would reach the Western Conference Finals in 85 and win 54 games in 1988. So definitely a, a, a successful season for them for sure. Yeah, the biggest thing to me looking at these like you know, late 70s, early 80s Nuggets is you're just reminded that, uh, well, first of all, the Isil and Thompson were enough. You know, a lot of people, again, kind of wondered how could they translate to the, to the NBA. They were enough. Those two guys clearly were good enough to translate. Um, but then there's the shame of, da- of David Thompson's career. It's like how good he was and, and how efficient he was. It's like he wasn't just a gunner. I mean, especially that first season in the NBA, shot 52% from the field for a guard. That's it's still at that point in, in basketball. That's very impressive. Um and just yeah, it's such such a shame that we didn't really get to see a full career from him. Um, and and you saw it kind of bear out in that that eighty season for the Nuggets is like that should have been probably the smack in the middle of the prime of his career, and it just you know didn't happen. But they, they responded well and, and eventually you know had a pretty good run in the eighties. Yeah, uh, yeah, they they were a very good team. You didn't, never quite a great team, but they were a very good team in the eighties, and obviously were, were 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 fun to watch setting all those scoring records. Uh, so next to the San Antonio Spurs, they had um, moved from Dallas uh, as the Chaparrales before the 74 season, um, he- were helped by uh, co-owner Angelo Drosis, who made a lot of bold moves, including um, trading for uh, Sven Nader and George Gervin from the um, Virginia Squires on um, uh, in separate trades that added to their draft for James Silas, and they had power forward center Kobe Dietrich, who was, they were all kind of key parts of these late eight, late 70s, early 80 Spurs teams. Uh, Bob Bass was the sort of broader running gun style to the uh, team that they would uh, help them get be successful and really take San Antonio for, by storm. San Antonio, not necessarily a market that the NBA wanted to get into, but these Spurs were pr- you know pretty successful almost right away. Uh, 76 season, they they were 50 and 34 with 3.82 SRS and got even stronger with some smart trades. So. They kind of made, you know, Dallas had not really been a very good franchise. In, in that last season in Dallas, there were some kind of some ugly um, accusations about, um, you know, black players being traded for white players or, you know, to just that, those reasons. You know, they were able to kind of move on, you know, get new ownership, move to a new city, and pretty quickly made themselves into an appealing team, getting George Gervin obviously the most important, um, you know, acquisition during that time. Right. And, 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 you know, people always talk about the consistency of the Spurs, you know, now and stuff like that, but it really started then. Uh, kind of the second they got to San Antonio, I mean, from the time they've gotten to San Antonio, they only missed the playoffs four times. And, you know, what is that, a 43 year history? That's an incredible, incredible stat. And, uh, you know, granted, a big part of that is two just lucky days in the lottery. But, um, but no, it really did start just with the, with the Gervin era and, and Silas era, San Antonio Spurs. And, and I mean, I'm from San Antonio, so. Uh, obviously, that they play a big kind of role in my basketball upbringing, so I can speak to it. It's the, the city is obsessed with the team, and that seems to have been the case since they first got there. So to see them succeed right away, uh, both in the ABA and then once they made the move to the NBA, um, is awesome. And it's, and it's and it's great that that's what set the template for something that's still continued today. Um, that's you know that we can trace it all the way back to that. That's that's just again just mighty impressive. Uh, and that last year in the ABA, the, the the trades they made that were helpful for down the line, they they got Larry Keenan and Mike Gale for Sven Nader in June of '75, and then and then got Billy Pultz for Rich Jones, uh, Kim Hughes, and two other players in September, which solidified themselves for the uh, next few seasons. Um, Keenan and Pultz, in particular, and Gale were all uh, strong players. Um, 
Mark Olberding, who they was another key young player for the team that um, was another guy who s- stuck around through the early 80s. And then they had George Carl on their bench, who was a good, uh, you know, was a, a deep on the bench, but was kind of a, a gritty, tough uh, guard during that time. Um, and um, 77, they were, the first year in the NBA, they were 44-38 and 38 with a .53 SRS. So, so not a... Um, not, not, not a strong SRS, but they made the playoffs. Um, Doug Moe had taken over as coach from uh, Bob Bass. Uh, they had added, um, you know, they didn't change too much. They added a little bit on the um, on the very bottom of the team, but didn't necessarily, you know, um, they basically had that pretty much the same core that they had had already previously. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, kind of the most random, you know, guy that was on, made the roster was Mike D'Antoni for two games, scored three points for the 77 San Antonio Spurs. So we had Mike D'Antoni and George Carl on the same team at one point um, in the 70s, which is kind of cool. But yeah, the Billy Pollitz, you know, giant uh, Billy Pollitz, it really made an impact for this team. And it was very much an offensive unit. They had number one in the league in pace, were 20th out of 22 in defensive rating, third in offensive rating. So it was a run and gun team to the core. And that, that kind of was perfect with George Gervin's game, who played absolutely no defense but could really, really score. Yeah, and um, Silas hurt his knee in the preseason, but um, and never completely the same as a player. He would come back in a couple years, but um, I, unfortunately, that you know um, hurt what was an incredibly promising career. Um, they also had, but that opened that opened that that injury opened up Larry Keen and and for the opportunity for him to really step up and he kind of made his name that season. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, and even though they struggled kind of that regular season or, you know, relatively they, you know, um, compared to the previous season and the next season, they, um, that was obviously helpful. They, they were swept by the Celtics, a two, two Oh, in the first round back when there were three game series in the first round. Yeah. They had Louis Dampier and Matt Calvin on the bench as well. So some ABA veterans uh, there, but, um, the, the changes were relatively minor 78. They, they really kept basically the same roster as well. Um, but, uh, you know, it, with Gervin's growth and Keenan and Paltz all leading the way, they were still very good. They had some, uh, injuries to their guards, um, Gale and Carl and, and Silas was still hurt. Um, and they s- kind of struggled early on in the season, but from um, January 1st to the end of the March, they actually went 30 and nine to clinch the central division title. So had a really good, um, had a really good season. They're 52 and 30 overall 3.2 SRS. Uh, and um, they were favored to beat the bullets in the first round, but then the bullets uh, ended up, uh, who I think at 44 wins ended up uh making a surprising run to the finals and beat uh, the Spurs in a hard-fought six-game series. So a tough break for them. The Bullets won game six, 103-100, to 100, and uh, actually most of their wins were, um, yeah, yeah, three of those wins were by four game, four points or less, so it's a very close uh, series. And sim- a similar fate would befall them in 79, unfortunately, for the uh, Spurs. Yeah, 79 is the first kind of heartbreaking series in the minds of, of, of big Spurs fans. But yeah, that 78 season, they had a really good stretch in that January-February zone where they went 15-2 and two and just were putting up, routinely putting up 120, 125-point games. Um, uh, kind of, that was kind of the prime of that season. Um, and so yeah, obviously Doug Moe, that's, that's the philosophy is just get the ball out and go. And, and yeah, it led, to, it led to a fun team and, and almost, you know, a successful playoffs. But, uh, but no, as, we, as you said, the next year is the one that's the real heartbreak. Yeah, so 79 season, they're 40 and 34 with a 4.97 SRS, so very very strong numbers. And this is 79 is kind of the last year where that that really heavy parity is still there. By 80, when Magic and Bird come into the league, there's there's more of the normal stratification. There's 60 win teams and you know under 20 win teams again. But for you know uh, the you know the 77 to 79 years particularly, we, and Rich and I talked about this in a previous episode. Yeah, there's, there's there's that very narrow. You know, those records are pretty close. So 48 wins is more impressive than you would think it would be. Um, Silas is healthy. Uh, Gervin leads the league in scoring uh, for the second year in a row. Becomes the first guard in NBA history to win back to back scoring titles. Um, they were 14 and 14 when Silas came back, and they were 34 and 20 um, after that. Uh, won the division one game ahead of the Rockets, and they um, almost blow a 2-0 lead to the Sixers in the the Eastern Conference semifinals, but were able to um, able to uh, fend them off and uh, beat them by uh, three points in the final game. And then they go up 3-1 to the Bullets in the Eastern Conference finals, have a chance to go to their first NBA finals, but then the uh, 
The Bullets win uh, 107, 103, 108 to 100, and 107 to 105 in the last three games of the series to advance and go to the uh, finals where they would lose to the uh, Sonics, uh, not defend their title. So, I, you know, on one hand, obviously the Bullets had won the championship the year before and were, you know, the more accomplished team in, in a sense. Um, but uh, even though they were, you know, kind of near the end, uh, Unseld and Alvin Hayes were both aging quite a bit and Dandridge to a degree too, so they didn't really have, you know, they. Their window wasn't much longer, where at least it seemed like the uh, Spurs certainly had, you know, were, were still fairly young and certainly had a chance at a strong future. But unfortunately for the Spurs, this was the closest they would, you know, get to until, you know, 1999 as far as, you know, being a champion. Right. And that game seven is kind of a real heartbreaker. And like I said, the first one in kind of San Antonio history that people trace back to, it'd be like, well, that was. That was one of the first chances to really do something in the NBA. Uh, George Gervin at 42 in Game 7, Bob Dandridge 37. But uh, the Bullets, in the end, were a little more balanced and just, just kind of had a little bit too much for San Antonio. But, yeah, giving up that 3-1 lead, that's uh, that's one that's going to be tough to take and probably probably one that guys like George Gervin and James Hiles, um still still think about. And if, in fact, I know I know they do. You know, you hear interviews now where they, they say uh, that's the one that definitely got away. Yeah. Uh, so they're down a bit in 1980, 41 and 41. Then they did have three strong years under Stan Albeck. They get Artis Gilmore during that time, but just can't quite break through the Lakers at that point, who become the powerhouse of the West. Uh, they join the Western Conference in 81, and they're solid enough team until about 86, where they did, they have to rebuild. And then it, the, obviously the rebuilding doesn't ha- doesn't take too long as they get David Robinson and you know by the early 90s start to become a very good team again and and, and finally break through as a championship team of course after the you know, 97 getting Duncan and and every listener to this probably knows the rest so right and actually 99 obviously becoming the first ABA team to win an NBA title so um so pretty cool that they were able to accomplish that yes and so far the only ABA team to win a yeah. NBA title yep. yeah so I guess, I guess they have enough for everybody yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not complaining for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Pacers at this point are um, kind of rebuilding after the glory days. Uh, seven, they'd gone to the finals in 75, kind of a dark horse there. 76, 39-45, they're uh, with a .29 SRS. Uh, George McGinnis had left the NBA after after that run, uh, so they didn't play the season. Uh, they had Don Busey, Billy Knight, who was a good scorer, Len Elmore, Dave Robish, and Dan Roundfield. Uh, they still had Billy Keller and Darnell Hillman from the old days. Uh, 77 season, the first in the NBA, 36 and 46 with a negative um, 1.68 SRS. Uh, Billy Knight is second in the league in scoring 26.6 points per game. Don Busey leads the league in both steals and assists, um, actually, which is interesting. Uh, they uh, In 77, they, they add uh, Will Jones and Super John Williamson, who they get from the Nets. Um, not, not their smartest trade. Uh, they also get Freddie Lewis back for 32 games. Following the seasons, the, uh, the Pacers would trade away... Uh, they would trade away uh, Billy Knight to the Braves for Adrian Dantley and Mike Bantam, and then Busey to the uh, Suns for Ricky Subber. So both their all-stars are gone. Uh, the Pacers also struggled financially after the merger. They had to hold a telethon to sell 8,000 tickets in uh, July of 1977, or they would have been sold to the uh, highest bidder. So they were, were successful in that and obviously able to stay in Indiana, but it kind of shows the you know, the high price that they had to pay. They did not have rich ownership uh, going into the um, NBA and the, the high price that they, they had to pay and um, may have led to them, you know, having a lot of pressure and not necessarily making the smartest moves during that pressure there. Um, um, Slick Leonard became their general manager um, during this time. And actually uh, his wife became the official general manager, Nancy Leonard, um, because she did more of the you know the day to day operations where you know Slick was kind of a lead decision maker, but uh you know he hadn't been that during the Pacers glory days and and probably was not necessarily the best suited to that role. Yeah, no, I I think it's an interesting point you brought up about the about the financial situation. Um, they also were really the only team that came into the ABA without a marquee star in his prime. Um, and it kind of showed, like you were saying, even when they made the 75 finals, it was like, yeah, the, the team was kind of passive at that point and really not quite what they once were. And, and it was it was really of the four teams, I guess, well, eventually the Nets obviously had to sell their superstar, but um, it was really the only one that, that you could kind of point to and be like, okay, they're probably going to struggle for a bit. And it really it took them a good 10 years before they could get back to being a, a consistently really good team. So um, kind of a bummer for them, but, but still, in the end, definitely – it's definitely a good thing that they that, that was one of the four teams that came over because the course of the ABA uh, history clearly one of the teams that deserved to go to the NBA. So unfortunately, it took them some time to get you know used to the new league, but eventually they made, they found their way. 
So for the uh, 78 season, they're 31 and 51 with a negative 2.37 SRS. They uh, trade Adrian Dantley, who they, who they just gotten, and Dave Robish for James Edwards, later of, of Pistons fame, and Earl Tatum. They sent John Williamson back to the Nets for Bob Carrington in the middle of the season, so Super John goes back to the Nets. So basically, almost completely overhauled roster in a in a year. Len Elmore, only, the only guy remaining from the ABA days, and he was only there for the last couple of years. Um, there's a uh, SI article from December of '78 uh, doing a feature on on Slick Leonard, and just you know he's now, of course, the Pacers who were you know the such a great franchise in the ABA are having their issues in the NBA. Noting, however, that the, of course, the Pacers had three women in key positions, including Nancy Leonard, uh, which, uh, which was unusual for the, uh, you know, the NBA during the time. And uh, Slick Leonard's quote here is interesting. It, it wouldn't have mattered to me if the leagues had never merged. As it turned out for us, joining the NBA was like committing financial suicide. So he was not happy with, in, with life in the NBA at that point. No, no, that's a pretty uh, dramatic thing to, to say about what should have been such a cool occasion. Yes. So the 79 season, 38 and 44, negative 1.41 SRS. Dan Roundfield left for the Hawks feed for agency. Billy Knight, who had been playing for the Celtics, actually brought back midseason in exchange for Rick Roby. Now, Rick Roby had been drafted instead of Larry Bird. Um, they had a chance to draft Larry Bird and... Um, and even met with him and then decided that they couldn't do so, that they needed to wait, you know, they, they, they couldn't wait for another player. And part of that was because Roundfield left that that's um, Mark Monty told me that during uh, the, our Pacers podcast. So, you know, they, they had a chance at getting Larry bird and to make the same choice. The Celtics did basically draft him and then wait a year, but they, but they felt they couldn't do that. And then uh, obviously if they had done that, that would have you know, changed, the, that would have changed things around for them significantly. No question, changed the entire dynamic of the league, um, and and potentially, you know, really it might have hurt the popularity of the league. Um, yeah, I, I, that'd be interesting because I, I mean, I would, Bird was so transcendent that I kind of think he might have been able to. I mean, in Indiana, so basketball crazy in a way that I actually think that might have worked out okay. I mean, not as well as Boston, but that still I think would have had some appeal. But I mean, obviously Boston it would have had more appeal. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, th- I think obviously it's it's easy now. We're like, well, clearly it worked out. But um, yeah, I think Indiana, it, it just he might have been joining a team that wasn't as prepared to contend. Th- that's and maybe true. Yeah, that would have taken time. It's not like he would have had the the Lakers Celtics thing like right away. Where like they're both winning championships, you know, in their first couple of years of their career. Um, that that might have taken some time, and, and maybe eventually we get a Pacers Lakers thing in like '85. But um, but yeah, for it for it to just kind of kick off the way it did, it's like it just kind of perfectly happened, Boston LA, and so you have you have to wonder. The Indiana one that might not have uh, might not have been as good for the NBA. That, that's true. Um, they also trade the, for Johnny Davis for, for the Blazers for the pick that became Michael Thompson. They signed Alex English from the Bucks, um, and Sam Nassie uh, bought the team for in in seventy nine, um, and uh, by eighty three would become close to having a uh, so much debt that he was close to returning the team to the league before he was able to get a uh, seller, which is ironic because Sam Nasty was known, I guess, for buying bankrupt companies and sort of selling off their, um, you know, and, and sort of telling, uh, turning them around. And then Nasty himself uh, would, would be in a position where he was almost back up with the team. So at the 79 80 season, the, early in 79, they actually uh, signed Ann Myers, who was a UCLA star. Uh, she became the first uh, player, uh, first player, first woman to sign a professional uh, NBA contract. She had a tryout with the team and was let go after uh, three days. She talks about that a lot in her book. And we have a, another episode on um, on women in the 1970s where we get more into details on that. Uh, this is also Slick Leonard's final season. He ends up being replaced by Jack McKinney. Uh, they tried to recapture some of their f- former glory by acquiring George McGinnis from the Nuggets, but they ended up trading away Alex English in a first-round draft pick, and that, that went poorly. Uh, McGinnis didn't really have uh, much left, unfortunately. They did make the playoffs in 81, which is the only time between 77 and 86 they would, and then by the early 90s, it would take until really the early 90s for them to actually start their turnaround once they drafted Reggie Miller and um, you know boosted themselves with a few, you know, a few other guys. But... Um, so yeah, not not as good of a situation for the um, the, the Pacers. Unfortunately, they, they, I mean, look at all the guys they had that ended up leaving. You know, Dan Roundfield, who was a very good player for the Hawks in the you know in the early '80s. Um, Alex English, who they traded away. Um, Michael Thompson, the draft pick, who they traded away. I mean, they um, you know Adrian Dantley, who they traded away. Um, I mean, a lot of talent there that they ended up um, giving up on pretty early. That you know, 
you, you never know how things are going to work out. You know, keeping one or two of those guys probably would have certainly been beneficial, but you know, it's, it's hard to know things at the time. No, definitely. It's, it's clearly a case of, of just kind of mismanagement um, the, of a roster that was aging that they could have kind of you know, really helped by throwing in those kind of youth, uh, youthful pieces and just, just didn't have the foresight to do so. And it's, it's a real shame for, for the fans of Indiana that they had to wait that long after the ABA to kind of become good again. So the New York, soon-to-be New Jersey Nets, uh, 76, their final year in the ABA. They win the championship, their second title in three years. They actually, an even better regular season team in 75, the year they were upset by the uh, Spirits. Um, Dr. J, Super John Williamson, Brian Taylor, Bill Melchioni in his final season were there from the 74 team. They also had coach um, Kevin Lockery, and they also had Al Skinner and Tim Bassett on the 76 teams. And we mentioned before the um, the Nets and Pacers trades that w- in which the Nets are, had gotten um, Swen Nader and Rich Jones. Um, well, now uh, we talked about how the Spurs got the better of the trades long term. Jim J- Jones was actually important to the Nets winning the title in '76. Nader was hurt during that time and actually traded to the Virginia for Jim Eakins, who was also helpful in '76. So it, it clearly was a win for the Spurs, but the Nets certainly got some benefit out of it as well. They they probably would not have made won the '76 title if they had not made those trades. So, um, so certainly a benefit for them. Um, the merger was really harmful to the Nets even more so than the other teams because on top of the $3.2 million they had to pay for just for joining the league, they also had $4.8 million in territorial fees for the Knicks on Julius Irving trying to get a, a bigger contract now that he's in the richer league and they can't afford to do that, so they sell him. They offered to sell him to the Knicks first to, in, in, to get rid of the $4.8 million in territorial fees. Uh, the Knicks say no, so he ends up being sold to Philadelphia for three million dollars. And um, the Sixers, of course, become the uh, you know a, a really powerful team that finally wins a championship in '83 and makes uh, four finals during um, Irving's time there. And the uh, the Nets struggle very much, so that's obviously a big swing for them. Yeah, I, um, the Dr. J thing is everything to that franchise. It was just absolute killer um, that he that he was forced to be sold, and it's it kind of it's similar to like the LeBron in 2014. It's like you know he leaves one franchise and there's a huge drop off, and that team that was awful the year before just immediately becomes a title contender, and makes the finals, and very similar to Dr. J. You know, 77 team makes the finals, and that 75 team or 76 team, the Nets um, that won the title. You know, lots of nice little players, but Dr. J was by far the best player on the team and um and and really just a dominant force in the league at that time and and a huge get for the aba you know it's like that's he was the main attraction uh so great that he could go to a team that where he could contend right away but a real shame for the nets because uh you know it took him forever to to recover from it and uh and yeah just just kind of said that that was the price of you think if maybe they could have just moved maybe the nets come over but they moved to you know some city that didn't have a franchise didn't have to sell dr j the entire history of their franchise would look totally different Absolutely. Um, so, as we mentioned, the '77 season. They actually, in September of that season, before before Irving ends up being traded, they trade for Tiny Archibald. Uh, they give up two draft picks that end up being Phil Ford and Otis Birdsong, who are both really good guards for the Kings in the late '70s and early '80s. Uh, also, Jim Eakins and Brian Taylor, who were two key pieces in the um, in, in the last championship team. Uh, to the Kings, so so really, um, unfortunately for the Nets, even though getting Tiny Archibald and pairing him with Irving sounds like a smart idea, uh, one they lose Irving, and two Archibald only plays thirty four games for them. He ends up getting hurt, and and that unbalanced trade, you know, happens. Or, you know, it becomes an unbalanced trade because of that. Even though you know at, at that point Archibald was one of the premier guards in the NBA, and just ends up a being a worse a situation for them. Right, and I mean that that seventy seven team really just a, a lot of bad luck. I mean the the Archibald injury, he only played thirty four games, but Bob Love and Mel Daniels, you know, big names from the seventies, were also on that team, but only played thirteen and eleven games respectively. Yeah. So and I, uh, I think that was a case of them just being at the end and not having much left. You know, right, right, right. Yeah. You know, so. yeah, it's like that. In in if you just look at that roster of paper, you're like, oh, that could have been a heck of a team. But there's actually a Sports Illustrated cover with uh, Dr. J and Dave Cowens on the cover, and it's like, oh, the merger, like here we go, this you know new league, and Dr. J's in a net jersey right um only to be traded you know a couple weeks later sure, um, yeah. yeah he ended up I, I believe he joined the the sixers the day before the season began so it was it was right up at the edge of the season so right right um yeah there's a, there's an article about, about archibald talking about like you know because he actually um you know he was from he was from new york and he uh he was excited to uh you know play with the nets and 
uh he, he bought his mother a house close to nassau coliseum he was he dreamed of playing with with irving and just it, it seemed like it was going to be an awesome combination and you know, it's one of those great what if uh things that would have you know been exciting and you know he, he and then he realized soon like once okay this is not going to be a good situation and the injury only made things worse and then it you know it, then he would be traded to the braves where he would you know injure his acl and he, that would look like it was career threatening and fortunately for him he would um end up rebounding with the Celtics and winning a championship there and, you know, being pretty good for the early eighties. But, um, but yeah, obviously that, uh, the, the idea of the, of the flashy team with Irving and Archibald together would have been pretty exciting too. Um, they did get Jan von Bredikoff, uh, through his personal draft. He was actually, he ended up being a pretty good player for the uh, Nets for a few years and they traded uh, super John to the uh, Pacers, uh, for Darnell Hillman and a draft pick that became Bernard King. So uh, another really bad, uh, trade for the, the Pacers. They could have had the trade that was, they could have had Bernard King, uh, uh had they drafted him. So that's the hits continue. <laughs> yes. So that was beneficial for the Nets there. Um, 78, they are 24 and 58 with a negative 5.61 SRS. Uh, they move from um, they moved to New Jersey, the Rutgers Athletic Center in Piscataway, while a new arena was built in Meadowlands. And, and I talked um, during our show with about um, uh, franchise moves. We kind of went through where the Nets went for uh, during their time, the, the cities they went through, and this was by far the furthest away from the city that they were that they they, they went to. So this was kind of out in the boonies for uh, almost out of nowhere. Uh, they they did trade um, Archibald during the off season for George Johnson and two first rounders. Um, one of those became Michael Richardson, but unfortunately that was traded away in a different trade that we'll uh, get into for the next season. They their big move of the time drafting Bernard King, who averaged twenty four point two points per game, nine point five rebounds per game, and acquired Kevin Porter from Detroit for Al Skinner and um, and got Eddie Jordan, um, their future coach, uh, on waivers that played for. Um, uh, it played for them for a little while. Uh, 79 season, they improved to 7, 37 and 45, negative 4.00 SRS, and actually made the playoffs. They're one of the worst playoff teams by SRS ever, and they were their benefit was to be swept in two games by Julius Irving and the 76ers. So, not not ideal for them. Yeah, no, that, and that to to have that be Julius Irving is just like kind of like a knife through the heart. Um, really unfortunate. It's like, oh, that guy really should be on our team, but uh, here he is knocking us out of the playoffs. I, I, I do have one question for you. I wonder, do you think it's fair that that the Nets were forced to kind of have that New York, you're coming into our territory thing? Like, I mean, I guess it's not fair, but do you think New York was in their right to do that? Or the league was in the right to uh, to impose that on the Nets? Um. I mean, I, I don't really see. I mean, it's easy to say now because the Nets have never really been like a threat to the the Knicks. I mean, the Knicks are firmly established. The Nets have, you know, they've had their good times. But I mean, I, I kind of think it would have been better if, um, I, I honestly, I probably think it better if, if the um, if they had taken the Colonels instead of the Nets, like long term, if they had taken the Colonels instead of the Nets into the um, ABA, and the Nets had never gone there. I guess that, I mean. You know, as, as sad as that says, I mean, really, Dr. J was the one guy who, obviously, who meant everything and was 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 the merger. So um, that would have been weird. They would have had to find a place for him to go or whatever. But um, I mean, I, I guess long term, I feel like a situation of having like a pretty strong market in Louisville, even though it's a small market, probably would have worked out pretty well. Um, Might have worked out better than the Nets did. Although, I mean, the Nets have, I guess, by just playing in that area and you know, and, and with being in Brooklyn now, have probably you know maybe merchandise wise and just you know market size wise and you know getting fans wise may that might still have been a better deal even though the nets have largely been an afterthought other than you know the jason kidd years right because because in my mind i'm thinking okay if we're going to add this team that's going to come into the new york market want to make a splash you've got to let them keep dr j so it's like if you're going to take him away anyway why would you have not let the Saint, you know, the spirits of St. Louis or Kentucky Colonels come over because I, th- I think you're right. Is at any point in the NBA's history after 1977 they could add a team to New York? I don't think that would have been that difficult. You know, an expansion team if they thought this really could we could really use this just like they did in LA. St. Louis makes sense as a market, but the spirits are such a huge mess. I mean, they were playing with right, Utah right, right. before they were gone, and they, I mean, they were yeah that that didn't seem realistic. And the Colonels. Um, you know, no, Kentucky's the one that definitely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. They, they by then were doing pretty well, but um, although they had, you know, they they did have to sell Dan Nissel, you know, for financial reasons, so it wasn't like they were doing that great in Louisville. So Louisville may not have been tenable, thinking more about it. But you know, the team, you know, was a 
know, it's, it's, it's hard because, I mean, you know, the Nets may have, like, their owner, Roy Bo, had a lot of, he had other financial issues too. He owned the Islanders and, they, and he was running into, you know, issues there as well. So, uh, you know, that's it, a hard thing to do in respect. It, it does seem having to pay that much to, you know, to, to go in there. I mean, I guess, like, if I were the Nets, I would, try, I would have just tried to move to a different city rather than try right. to, yeah, I mean, that would have made more sense. Move to a different city with Irving. Yeah, yeah. with yeah. Irving. Yeah. And right. I don't, I don't right. know how realistic that was, but, um, I mean, you know, obviously the the merger happens in June and the season, you know, is September, October. So, you, you know, that's that's a tall task. So, yeah, maybe, right. I, you know, yeah. I guess if the yeah, question would have been. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I, just, I was just kind of, just, I wonder what your thoughts were. I guess if the question would have been, you can have the Colonels with Gilmore or the Nets without Irving, you would have taken the Colonels, you know, every every day of the week. Um, yeah, but, yeah. I mean, so I it's kind of tough. The Bulls probably would have been okay with getting Irving, you know. Well, that's true. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah, because yeah, so, he would have been in high demand. He always would have been the number one pick of that dispersal draft. So yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, interesting question. I, uh, Lots of what ifs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and anyone who has any thoughts on that wants to tweet us at over and back. Uh, I I would NBA at over and back NBA. I'd be curious what you think. So, um, seventy eight seventy nine season. Um, uh, by the way, that that trade, that Phil Jackson trade, him, the Nets getting him. The, the the picks that were traded away became Michael Ray Richardson and um, Vinny Johnson. So not a, not a good trade for the Nets there. Although you know they they got, they got that Bernard King trade before, so that that worked out fine enough for them. So they um they traded Kevin Porter back to the Pistons for Eric Money and Porter in '79 would would set a league record for assists. So um as we mentioned, they were one of the worst t- t- teams by SRS ever. Um and they got Super John back from the uh, Pacers. So uh and then after that from 1980 um. And after they were actually a better SRS team in um, eighty, only just slightly below one, uh, thirty four and forty eight. They traded away Bernard King to the Jazz for Richard Kelly. This was during a time which Bernard King had drug and other issues. Did not, and things went really way south for him on the Jazz before he kind of got his act together and was better with the uh, Knicks. Uh, they kept Kevin Lockery through mid nineteen eighty one before they finally um, fired him. Larry Brown became the coach in 82 and the team improved. But as we mentioned, I think earlier, Larry Brown ended up leaving midseason again for the uh, right before the playoffs, actually, before 83. The team, their highlight um, really was upsetting the Sixers in the 84 playoffs under Stan Albeck. Um, and they did have they did actually have five straight playoff appearances between 82 and 86, though. And they had a decent run in the early 90s under Chuck Daly with um, with Kenny Anderson and Drazen Petrovic. But really, they struggled for the most part until the early 2000s. Yeah, and and not even just on the court, they struggled just to gain a foothold in that market in general. Yeah, um, and even though they did have some good seasons on the court, it's like it never really was a threat to the Knicks, and it's that's right. that's kind of a shame that that the very reason they had to sell Dr. J was never even a real thing. Right, and, and they were in the suburbs too. So I mean, right. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure you're still close enough to New York that you're still drawing. You know, like, like you're you're still have some big market advantages, even if you're not technically in the big market that you might not have in a smaller city um so it, right but it, even if the know. Knicks were just in manhattan it, i mean that's enough to support an nba team so right. as long as it wasn't you know down the street from madison square garden it's like it probably was never going to be a threat i i wouldn't i wouldn't think so yeah uh obviously they just did it because you know they they could I, I suppose, yeah, exactly you know? yeah, yeah yeah so i mean i would i would have done it too if i were the Knicks. so fair enough to them yeah <laughs> The dispersal draft was of the Kentucky Colonels and, and uh, Spirits of St. Louis players. Uh, Twelve were selected, eight were not selected, and those guys became free agents. Uh, the, the the Squires had folded a month before the merger, so their players were all became free agents, and unfortunately, their contracts were not um, honored. Some of those that had you know had been signed that through the ABA, they were not honored by the NBA teams because uh, those teams, had, which kind of sucks for them, obviously. Um, there's a good um, Steve Ashburner uh, feature on NBA.com from 2011 that kind of talks about this personal draft and, and talks about the uh, importance of it um, that where some of this information comes from. Um, Artis Gilmore went to the Bulls. He had a price tag of 1.1 million. This, these were all kind of used to sort to pay down some of the uh, debts from the uh, ABA. Uh, and in Gilmore, even though he wasn't a dominant player for the uh, Bulls, was still very good. He actually led them to a, um, a, a, a pretty good playoff run in 77. They uh, uh, were 
gave the Blazers a scare in a three-game series early on, and they they rallied from a tough start in 77 to kind of galvanize the uh, city. This was right after Richard Daly had died, so there was a, a you know kind of a, a sadness in Chicago to the, the longtime mayor had died, and this was kind of a, a community rallying event for them. And the, the Bulls didn't really, um, you know, they didn't have much long-term success under Gilmore. Um, you know, they, obviously they didn't really have much long-term success until Jordan, but uh, it was something I, it was another thing I had read about in the um, what's happening book that I thought was interesting. Yeah. I think, I think the Gilmore thing, especially, you know, in the ABA, he was able to dominate just by being the most dominant center. So when he got into a league that had a bunch of other big men that could kind of guard him and stuff like that, Chicago wasn't getting the same player that Kentucky had back in, you know, in the, in the earlier part of the seventies. So, um, you know, definitely right that he went number one in that kind of, or, you know, what we could call number one in that dispersal draft. Um, but yeah, it was not the same uh, player that, that, that Kentucky had. Yeah, and obviously different. You know, the, I think the three pointer helped Gilmore because it gave him more space in the lane, and obviously he was a, uh, yes. you know, the most dominant big man in the ABA. He's competing with um, Kareem and um, and Walton and other guys. Although Walton had a tough time with Gilmore, he talked about how you know Gilmore obviously big big for him. Um, Maurice Lucas went second. He actually went to the Hawks, uh, but the Hawks were uh, coached by Hebe Brown. And you and I talked about in our Kentucky Colonels episode how Hebe Brown and Maurice Lucas got into a competition with each other, and that wasn't going to happen. So he was traded to the Blazers for Jeff Petrie. Uh, really worked out for the um, for Portland as Lucas uh, obviously joined Bill Walton and others to help the Blazers win a championship. Jeff Petrie um, suffered a serious knee injury, never played for the Hawks, and uh, the Hawks actually really uh, the ABA. Uh, went very poorly for the uh, Hawks. In addition to this, they also uh, lost out on uh, David Thompson and uh, Marvin Webster in the first and third picks of the 75 draft because of the ABA. So they, they did, the Hawks could not do anything right when it came to the ABA. All right. Uh, then Ron Boone uh, went to the Kings, and he, he did pretty well for the Kings. He continued his durable streak that he started with the uh, Stars and uh, played through um, the early 80s. So he had a strong time. Marvin Barnes to the Pistons, not so good for the uh, Pistons. He was uh, basically out of the league after playing with four teams for the next uh, three or four years. Um, even though he averaged 15.2 points, 9.2 rebounds, but just uh, was really inconsistent, drug issues, um, it, behavior issues, everything bad. So then Moses Malone to the Blazers, um, and of course he became one of the greats of all time in the NBA. Unfortunately, not for the Blazers. They traded him soon to Buffalo, uh, and then Buffalo flipped him uh, to Houston, where he had his initial success. Then Randy Denton to the Knicks. Uh, he did not uh, do much; only played for a few more, a couple more years in Atlanta. Uh, Bird Everett to the Braves, who lasted two seasons, was done at age 25. Will Jones to the Pacers, who was done after two seasons at age 30. Ron the Plumber Thomas, who was played for Louisville, was picked ninth by Houston, never played in the NBA. I'm not really sure why. Uh, Louis Dampier to the Spurs. He lasted a few more years uh, there. Um, I, I think he retired right before the three-point uh, shot came back to the uh, NBA. Which He did. Been... He played three seasons. So, yeah, he retired yeah, the season before. Yep. Right. That would be interesting to see how he would have done with the uh, with the NBA three-point line. Um, as we mentioned before, uh, Jan von Bredikoff to the uh, Nets, who did pretty well. And then Mike Barr to the Kings, who played one season in Kansas City and then was uh, done. I believe Kansas City was the only uh, team to make multiple pick in the uh, dispersal draft. And actually, interestingly enough, um, some of the other alumni of note in the NBA um, actually did sign with the uh, Kings as well. Um, Gus Gerard and a couple other guys ended up playing with with, with the Kings. So they, they were uh, one team that was willing to take advantage of the ABA talent. They actually had one of their best runs in Kansas City. Kind of the 78, 79, 80 run was kind of the, the best that they uh, was was about the best they sort of did during that time. Some other key ABA guys who did some things in the NBA, of course, Caldwell Jones, who signed with the Sixers and spent six seasons there as a part of their contending teams, was two-time uh, All-NBA First Team defense and played until 1990. Uh, Sven Nader, who um, two-time All-Star uh, and played with the Braves and Clippers through the early 80s. Uh, Mount Calvin, who was a five-time All-Star in the ABA, bounced around a bit uh, five times in five teams in four seasons and ended his career in 81. Uh, Willie Wise was a three-time All-Star, played just more than one season before injury retired him at age 30. Fatty Taylor played one more year with Denver before retiring at age 30. Emil Carr had a good run, played three years with Detroit, then played with Boston through their championship teams in the early 80s. Uh, Don Chaney, who had gone and played one year with the Spirits, did not, which did not go well for him, then spent a season in L.A. with their strong uh, 77 team that uh, had uh, Kareem and uh, Kermit Washington. 
and um, then uh, was swept by the Blazers after some injuries. Then they, he went back to Boston through 1980, retiring at age 33. Gus Gerard was a talented uh, guy for the Spirits and the Squires who bounced around the league until uh, 81 at uh, age 27, dealt with some drug issues. Jim McDaniels was a towered college star who bounced back and forth between the NBA and the ABA and then played 42 games in Buffalo in 78, then finished his career. And Johnny Newman, who was a sort of a, like a, a poor man's uh, Pete Maravich, who was out of the NBA at age 26 in 1978. So, Right. And, and I, I'm, I'm curious to see if you found anything on this, but uh, on, on the dispersal draft Wikipedia page, which, you know, I understand it's Wikipedia, but um, they have James Fly Williams, who's kind of the main character in Heaven is a Playground, the great book uh, by Rick Thielander, um, as a as a pick for the Sixers, but he never actually played in the NBA. He only played one year at the Spirit of St. Louis the year before the merger. So um, I don't know if you saw anything about him, but did he ever actually have any sort of tryout with the Sixers, or was that just a... Uh, is that just a Wikipedia? Someone throwing it on there? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I hadn't seen that. I guess that doesn't surprise me entirely because he still had some talent, even though. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but you know, he he did struggle a little bit with the uh, with the spirits and didn't really stick stick there. But I mean, he, you know, um, I mean, he did play with the spirits. He was it was in the ABA, I think, in their final season. So I guess it wouldn't have shocked me. But uh, yeah, I, that that one I had not heard about, so I'm not sure. Yeah, so that was interesting. Yeah. So finishing up, some looking at how the ABA players did um, all the time, um, according to Terry Pluto from Loose Balls, of the 84 active ABA players at the time, 63 appeared in NBA games the next season. Uh, 10 of the 24 All-Stars were former ABA players. Um, only one of them, Rick Barry, did not begin his career in the ABA. Um, of the league's top 10 scores, four were former ABA players, Billy Knight, David Thompson, Dan Issel, and George Gervin. Um uh, Don Busey led the league in steals and assists, we mentioned, for Indiana. Um, Moses Malone was third in rebounding. Artis Gilmore was fourth. And Gilmore and Cobo Jones were among the top five in block shots. Uh, five of the ten starters in the NBA Finals um, were from the ABA. Uh, Twardzik, Maurice Lucas, Irving, Cobo Jones, and George McGinnis. Uh, Denver won their division with a 15-32 record, second best in the NBA. And um, Tom Nasalki, who had been an a- ABA coach, was NBA Coach of the Year. And other ex-ABA coaches were Hebe Brown, Doug Moe, Slick Leonard, Larry Brown, and Kevin Lockery. So, uh, and in fact, it, Doug Moe did not uh, really thought that the ABA was a much better run league than the NBA, at least pre-David Stern. He, his quote from, which is from Loose Balls, which is very memorable, one of the biggest disappointments in my life was going into the NBA after the merger. The NBA was a rinky-dink league. Listen, I'm very serious about this. The league was run like garbage. There was no camaraderie. A lot of the NBA guys were aloof and thought they were too good to practice or play hard. So he did not have a lot of uh, good things to say about the NBA, at least before uh, David Stern came in. Right, and and look, a part of that's probably um, him just trying to defend the thing that he came from, but there's definitely some truth to that. And, and I mean, you see how much... David Stern, cha- David Stern changed the NBA. It's like, obviously, there was stuff to change it's because it was not being run well. So um, so I, def- I think he's definitely, there's some truth to that, to that statement. And, and clearly, the influx of that talent and then eventually getting a, a good leader on board really, really helped. Yeah, and there's also just a, a matter of, you know, finally the star, you know, they, the NBA had the right stars, too. And, you know, they, and then right. that led to growth right. in the league. I mean, I, some of it, I think, certainly was good leadership. And some of it was just, hey, you know, we we ended up with these tr- transcendent players all roughly around the same time that helped, you know, with the growth of our league. And then we managed it well, too. So uh, anything else you want to uh, bring up before we go? Uh, no, I think it's just interesting that the uh, the relative lack of, like, deep playoff success for the ABA teams. I mean, obviously, we talked about earlier the Spurs were the only – are still the only team that was an ABA team to win a title, which is kind of just mathematically kind of crazy. You know, four of the 30 – it's like you'd think – yeah, at least a couple of them would yeah. would have titles. So the fact that Spurs are the only one, and that they didn't even get to the finals till ninety nine, you know, twenty three years after the merger is pretty surprising. And then just after that, obviously the next year we have the Pacers, and then two years after that we have the Nets. So um, you know, after twenty three years of no one making the finals, we had three of the four teams getting in there, and the, the Nuggets obviously have never made the finals. So I thought that was interesting that you know four teams who all have had very success you know, since then, and only one of them's won a title. That's that's interesting. Yeah, I guess part of that, of course, is that relatively few NBA teams have won a title true, even during true. that time. You know, there's so many dynasties during that time that it has kind of kept that number sh- small. But yeah, that's a, that's a fair point. That is um, a little bit uh, surprising. And, and certainly the, even the Nuggets who haven't been to the finals have had, you know, some pretty good teams and some pretty good success. So they've, they've made some conference finals and, and so forth. So 
Um, right. Oh, and right. they were the best team that first year of the merger. So right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, they they, they looked like they you know, they definitely could have you know if, if a few breaks had gone their way, they definitely could have gone to the finals and maybe won a championship that year. So. Um, that would have been interesting having a David Thompson Julius Irving rematch um, in the '77 NBA Finals. Definitely, I mean, yeah, that's it, it. You would think of all the teams that could have taken advantage of that kind of odd you know, late '70s NBA. It's like the Nuggets were the one, um, and just and just you know through David Thompson's stuff or just yeah bad luck, it just didn't happen. Yeah. So, well, why don't you let everyone know talk a little bit about um, basketball pantheon before we go? Um, yeah, so we, we started this up. My, my friend Braden and I um, started it years ago. My brother helped us out on the site. And, but part of our site, some of it's just modern day stuff. You know, we talk about what's going on in the NBA right now. But a big part is we have kind of our lists that we rank the greatest commercials, greatest, you know, video games is going to be a big thing that we're going to do in the next couple months. Um, and then eventually we do kind of greatest players. I'm working on a big playoff project i've kind of mentioned a couple times that we're eventually going to rank greatest playoff series and actually have a formula for that so it's not just you know random like hey i think that series is great uh we actually will have a formula for that one um in the players list uh kind of infamously early on i did not include aba um stats for that but after after you know much more research two years ago is when we kind of first started the site and so our initial list did not have aba stats our newest update does and i'm going to change on our site kind of through you know some of the research i did for this and just you know reading more um making especially the last three or four years of the aba making those stats actually count towards some of those players that we've ranked and so you might see some some differences in the in the in the list as we as we move forward Cool. Well, I'm excited to uh, see what you got going on. I always uh, enjoy the stuff on your side. That, that playoff uh, series ranking sounds really interesting, though. I, don't, I can't think I've, I don't think I've ever seen anybody do something like that. So that seems like a you know a neat, uh, innovative thing that I'll definitely be interested to see what the uh, results are and be able to kind of dig into some playoff series maybe that I you know don't know about. I mean, you know, uh, looking forward to seeing what you got there, and then of course all the other stuff that you got going on. It's it's all good stuff. Thanks to Adam for being on the show again. He's a great guest as always and appreciate his insight. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. You can uh, find us at the step back at fansided.com. Uh, you can also find us on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Just search for Over and Back or The Step Back. Hope you've been enjoying our Basketball Mysteries of the 1970s series. And we're back again soon.